Good morning, church. How is everyone doing today? Good. All right, well, I'm going to start off with a couple announcements, but before I do that, I should probably introduce you just in case, or introduce myself, uh, just in case you don't know who I am. My name is Aaron. I am the new director to Young Families here at the Mission, and so that's who I am. My wife is over here. Her name is Mackenzie. Uh, hopefully, you got a chance to get to know me a little bit more last week when I told a little bit of my story, but if not, just pull me aside sometime, and I'll be happy to share some more information with you about who I am. I just uh, want to let you guys know that there is an offering plate over here, uh, just on a table. If you want to leave your offering there, that's for you. Uh, we do have Mission Kids today. We're going to dismiss them later on. And that's for children that are age 2 to 3 and from JK to grade 4. So we're happy to have that today. And there is a nomination that went out um, a survey, a survey monkey for the nominations. If you prefer to have a paper copy, you can ask Nancy, or I think there's some over here for you to um, have that you can fill out and then hand in that way if you don't want to use the uh, electronic version. And I think that's all for announcements. So if you would like to just join me in prayer this morning, we'll uh, kind of bring our hearts before God. Lord, we thank you so much for this wonderful opportunity for us to gather together. We, uh, we're reminded just how important that is and how significant that is um, in spite of just this time, the season where it's harder and harder to get together with people. So we're thankful for just for the good weather and for this opportunity to come together. We know that you are here, and so we come today to worship you, and to learn from your word how to be better disciples to follow you. We thank you um, just for who you are. You're so good, God. We ask that you would uh, open our hearts today to receive what we need from you, that we would um, be challenged where we need to be challenged, that we would be encouraged when we need to be encouraged, we'd be healed where we need to be healed, and we'd be empowered by one another and by your spirit. We turn our hearts over to you, God, and we thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, good morning. What is it? What's that? Oh, okay. What is it with the outdoor services? And it's a little windy again, but that's okay. Um, when I saw the girls, I've, I've asked them to join me for worship this morning. And when I um, saw them this morning, and they were dressed so nicely, and I'm in my jeans, I said, uh, "This, uh, what happened here?" <laughs> but anyway, I'm so glad to have them. We um, practiced quickly uh, two weeks ago, so we're a little rusty and we're a little nervous about doing this song, but we want to just uh, lift him this morning, uh, and, and it is really, really good <coughs> to be with them. And so uh, we will just start with holy, holy, holy. Okay. <coughs> Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, early in the morning our song shall rise to Thee. Holy, 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 merciful and mighty, God in three persons, blessed Trinity. Holy, 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 all the saints adore thee, casting down their golden crowns around the glassy sea. 
cherubim and seraphim falling down before thee, which word and art and evermore shall be. Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, all thy works praise thy name in earth and sky and sea. Holy, 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 merciful and mighty, God in three persons, blessed Trinity. Holy, 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 though the darkness hide thee, though the eye of sinful man thy glory may not see, only thou art holy, there is none beside thee, perfect in power, in love and purity. Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, all their works praise Him in earth and sky and sea. Holy, 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 merciful and mighty, God in three persons, blessed Trinity. God in three persons, holy, 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 Trinity. We did it. <laughs> okay. Woo. That's good to get that under our belt. <laughs> So I just wanted to read, this is one of my favorite uh, passages out of the message, and it is Romans 12, and very familiar to us for sure, but I just wanted to read it. Uh, it's just, uh, I turned to this one of these days this week when I was just praying out to the Lord. I, I really want to hear you on this, and it was something I was asking him about, and uh, I just... There's so many different things coming at you. And I was, I, I'm, I'm so uh, tired of, of the talking about COVID, about the rules, about the regulations, about this, about that, about everyone's, uh, every time you meet anyone, they talk about it. And I thought, oh, Lord, I just want you to be center in my life. And so I, I got to this um, Romans 12, and I, I, I'm reading it from the message. So here's what I want you to do, God helping you. Take your everyday ordinary life, your sleeping, your eating, your going to work and walking around life, and place it before God as an offering. Embracing what God does for you is the best thing you can do for him. Don't become so well-adjusted to your culture that you fit into it without even thinking. Instead, fix your attention on God. You'll be changed from the inside out. Readily recognize what he wants from you and quickly respond to it. Unlike the culture around you, always dragging you down to its level of immaturity, God brings the best out of you, develops well-formed maturity in you. So people, that is the God that we serve, the one that we can go to about everything, everything. I, I just love it. I, I, I want you just to remember that he is, yes, he's almighty, he's, he's maj majestic, he's everything, but he's also a daddy, and he loves us, and he wants to hear from you. So stand, let's just sing right out to him this morning.
we could ever bring. Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe, we live for you. Jesus, the name above every name. Jesus, the name above every other name. Jesus, the only one who could ever say.
Please be seated. Okay, Jan, you want to come up? All right, uh, this time we're going to dismiss our kids for Mission Kids. So like we said, we have a class for uh, kids age two and three, and for kids uh, from JK all the way to grade four. For you guys who are in grade five, six, seven, eight, we're working on it. Don't worry. <laughs> we'll get there. <laughs> but uh, yeah, you guys can make your way uh, to the side. And uh, like we did last week, parents, uh, they'll come and line up outside the wall in the gym behind me so you can sign them out uh, there. Okay, I'm going to hand over things to Jan for our prayer. Good morning on this windy, cool morning. Just my kind of weather. Anyway, a few prayer requests that I have to bring. This morning we need to remember Margaret uh, Siemens, Alex and Elva Suderman, and Esther and Noah. Esther is in London now in the hospital, and she will probably be staying there until the babies are born. And we, ne we need to remember the Kathy Suderman family. Just continue to lift them up in prayer that God will surround them with his mighty arms. And uh, Jack and Edith Bishop and <coughs> the Harry, I don't know if it's Walsh or Welsh family, but there was a death in the family and we just need to remember them in prayer. I called um, Shirley Guerin yesterday just to see how Joel was doing and if there was an update. And she said, yes, he's doing fine. He's had his second uh, surgery, which was more extensive than the first. And he will have to have radiation treatment. Um, but he, he is he healing well. And one of the praises is that he didn't lose his voice or his ability to swallow, because the doctors had told him that there was a good chance that that could happen. And from what Shirley said, the first thing he said to his wife when he woke up was, I didn't lose my voice. So we just thank God for that, for, you know, the way he works in our lives. And Shirley asked that we pray that God would use this situation for his honor and glory, that there would be others that come across Joel's path or whatever, that he can testify to the goodness of God and to the way God works in our lives. And also we need to remember the Cameron family. We haven't prayed for them for a while and I'm looking forward to them coming home and I'm sure mom and dad are looking forward to them coming home. <laughs> but we just need to pray for them because they are out there on the front lines, even though they're teaching or whatever, but they're still spreading the good news of God so as we go to prayer, I want to challenge you this morning. We are coming up on the Thanksgiving time. And as we come up to Thanksgiving, just stop and think, what am I thankful for? What do I have to be thankful for? I know I have many things to be thankful for. The biggest and the best is that I have God. And no matter what I go through in my life, what comes, what goes, God is there. If I can't see him, then I've kind of left him behind and I need to turn and see that he is right there on my left or my right. And that he is willing to come alongside as we want him to. It's a choice. We choose God. We choose his way. But in these next couple of weeks, just stop and think of all the things that you have to be thankful for. Another thing I'm thankful for is our, my church family. It's something I have missed greatly in the first few months of this COVID season. I miss the fellowship. I miss getting together with God's family singing his praises, sharing the ups and downs of our life, but most of all, sharing God's goodness. Let us bow. Father, we are so thankful that we are your children. I am so thankful, Lord, that I have you, that I can crawl up in your lap and say, Abba, Daddy, 
I hurt. Or I just need you to hold me in your arms. Father, we think of all the different prayer requests, spoken and unspoken, because I'm sure each one of us has a prayer request we can lift up to you. Lord, we just ask that you would reach down your mighty hand and meet us where we are, that you would love us, Lord, and that you would cause us to glorify you, that, Lord, without you, I am nothing. I am just a speck of dust on this earth. But, Lord, I thank you that I am your child. And, Lord, I just ask, as the service progresses, Lord, that you would bless each one of us. And, Lord, I just thank you for the blessing of the girls singing. Lord, it does my heart good to see them together again. Lord, we just ask that you would be with Pastor Ryan as he brings the message. Lord, that you would open our ears and open our hearts to what you have for us this morning. And Lord, let there be some nugget there that each one of us can take away and say, I am glad I've been to the house of the Lord. For we ask all these things in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. So our next song, King of My Heart, it, the, it always talks about you are good, good, good. God is so good. And I, I've just been sensitive this week to the people that are going through things where maybe it's really hard to say, you know what, God, you are good. You're good. We think of those that have got the prayer requests and others that haven't shared maybe what they're hurting. It could be physical. It could be mental. It could be emotional, everything. And I was reading in uh, Lisa Turker's her book, and it just really spoke to me. I'll share it just quickly, and then we're going to sing this song. And it, um, she talked about how she had been through a lot of trauma in her marriage and was just finally getting um, to the point where she thought, okay, God and I, we've got this. I'm really ringing. And um, so then all of a sudden she ended up, woke up in the, in the early morning with a severe, severe pain and uh, was rushed to the hospital. For five days they wondered what was going on. She was in severe pain. Nothing would stop it. And she kept praying out to God, God, where are you? Where are you? I've already been through all this other, and now I'm going through this, and it's painful. It's like you're not hearing me. I know you are good. I know all what I believe. But where are you, God? Why does this pain not go away? And uh, so then she finally, um, I guess there was one last test they needed to do. And uh, if this was the fifth day of her in, and seeing her family around here crying out to God and crying over her because she was in such pain. And um, the, this one doctor came in and said, you know what, I just have one more test to do. I don't know what else to do with you. And so he did it, and they found out that she had a twisted colon. And that later on, she said, you know what? Because he told her, he said, if you would have been home, if, if, if you wouldn't have been here, you would have died be instantly. Because as soon as this would burst, as it was ready to do, you would die. And she got thinking about that and thinking, okay, instead of looking and thinking about God standing by her bedside, cold, arms crossed, and like, well, you're in pain. I'm sorry, my child, and not that... She said when she thought of this and what the surgeon said, instead she said, I realized God was standing there by that bedside with his hand on her, crying with her, but wanting to tell her, hold on, child, you're right where you should be. I've got something good going to happen. You can't, if I stop the pain, you will die. And I thought, wow, that really spoke to me. And it just reminded me that, yes, it's hard to say, God, you are good when you're in pain, whatever it might be. But, oh, he is good, and he's got a plan. He has, he has the way it's all settled. And instead of that God with his arms crossed, 
hang in there, hang in there. He's like, no, no, no. He's touching. He's holding on to you. Saying, hang in there, child. I love you. So I hope that encourages you as it encouraged me. Encouraged me. Please stand and let's sing about how good our God is. <laughs>
Amen. Amen. Please be seated. Okay, how's everyone doing? Good? Yep. Now, can everyone hear me just as we get started? Yeah, right in the back, Nancy can hear me, so that's good. All right, she hears me enough. <laughs> she, or enough, she hears enough of me. <laughs> okay, so just bear with me, I guess, as we uh, try and preach outside with wind and book papers that can fly around and paper clips and things like that as I go along. This is going to look a little clunky, so... Um, but yeah, thanks so much. Uh, just so glad that we can just, you know, be all together. Thank you so much to our worship uh, team for just leading us and Jan for that prayer. It's just, it's great to be able to come and focus. You know, this is, I think for September, for many of us, especially for those of you with kids in school, this has been a, you know, certainly a couple weeks of, you know, distractions, right? There's been so much else to think about in these past few weeks. It's just great to take this time to think about what makes us who we are, Christ inside of us. And, you know, that is what we were here to focus on. And as we turn to the word to just think about uh, what he has for us this morning. <clears throat> so it was in, uh, it was March 2nd, uh, 1962 in the NBA. Caught some of your attention when I said that, didn't I? In the NBA, uh, a night that would go down in history when Hall of Famer, Wilt Chamberlain did something that has yet to be ever repeated. Now, does anyone know what he did that night? Yes, that's right. Wilt Chamberlain by himself scored a hundred points in one game. Okay. Now, some of you guys know a single basket's worth two, three points is you know three pointer, <laughs> and a foul shot. If you get one, it's just one per shot. So you got to imagine uh, what he accomplished on that night when he put together a hundred points. For his team, he scored, he only scored though 60% of the entire team's total points. They won that game against the New York Knicks like 162 to like, well it wasn't, it was like about 100 or so. He scored, uh, he scored 60% of all the points on that night. Believe it or not, almost all the big names in NBA history uh, have a night kind of like this. Uh, there's 72 recorded games in NBA history where a single player put up more than 60 points uh, by themselves in a single game. Most all of those are wins, um, but not all of them, but most of them are wins. 72 games, 76 games, sorry, 76 games where a single player put up uh, over 60 points in one game. Uh, each one of those games is considered uh, to be a historic game, and it goes into the record books. And if that statistic wasn't crazy enough, of all those 76 games that have ever been recorded, Wilt Chamberlain has his name beside 32 of them. Do the math on that. So he, of all these 76 games where a single player put up more than 60 points, he has 42% of all those games to his name and his name alone. Now, what I was thinking about this, and I was kind of putting the, you know, the sermon together, I thought, you know, what's kind of interesting about that statistic is that, yeah, his name goes beside all of those, you know, those games, and he gets the fame for that. But you know what? All the other players, the coaches, and the ownership they all benefit from these tremendous uh, efforts that these players put up because they get the win to their stats. And in professional sports, stat keeping is enormous. It's everything. It's what you use to negotiate your contract. Yet these players put up, you know, a big percentage of the whole points. They pretty much win the game. Not, they, they're not all of the, those games are wins, but I would, most of them are wins. And yet the other players, coaches, ownership, and the fans, they get to benefit from the win. They get to put the win on their stat sheet. You know, do you realize that you and I and all who gather and commit themselves to Christ are the benefactors of someone else's accomplishment? On this beautiful day, I want to talk about something beautiful. You know, it's going to be, this today's sermon is going to be a little bit like a gospel message. But I want to examine 
a part of the gospel message that I think goes underappreciated. You know, when we talk about salvation, we often talk about what we get, or we often talk about what we have to do, or we get to talk about, you know, the benefit that we receive with eternal salvation and redemption and transformation and change. But this morning, I want to focus on what God's role is in our salvation. How far did God go to restore this relationship with us? And I hope it brings us to a deeper appreciation of what God has done, and I hope it brings us to a deeper devotion to him. It isn't a sermon uh, it's on doctrine, but rather a sermon that brings deep appreciation for what God has done for us, how far he actually went to restore the relationship that was severed because of sin. And with that, let's just open with prayer. Father God, our eyes and our see what they want to see sometimes, and our hearts, our ears hear what we want to hear. Father, I pray this morning that your, would, your word would show us what you have done. Help us to see outside of ourselves. Help our eyes to see what you've done. Help our ears to hear about what you have done. Help us to not see what benefits us. Help us to not see what we want to see, but help us to look at what you've done that you can move us into a deeper appreciation for your efforts, for your sacrifice, for your love, and your commitment to us. I pray, Father, that our, your word this morning would move us to devote ourselves more fully to you, that we give ourselves more to you, and that, Father, during this time of busyness and distraction, we would also prioritize you. We would prioritize you as an, a, a sign of our appreciation for what you have done for us. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. So I'm just going to be reading this morning from Isaiah, and uh, we're going to look at the first five uh, verses um, of the uh, chapter 65. So Isaiah 65, verses uh, 1 to 5. I revealed myself to those who did not ask for me, I was found by those who did not seek me. To a nation that did not call on my name, I said, here am I, here am I. All day long I have held out my hands to an obstinate people who walk in ways not good, pursuing their own imaginations. A people who continually provoke me to my very face, offering sacrifices in gardens and, burnt and burning incense on altars of brick, who sit in the graves and spend their nights keeping secret vigil, who eat the flesh of pigs and whose pots hold broth of impure meat, who say, keep away, do not come near me, for I am too scared for you. Such people are smoke in my nostrils, a fire that keeps burning all day. So these are the closing, um, closing, this is the closing chapters, 65 and 66 are the closing chapters to the book of Isaiah, the, you know, the really, the all really important book uh, to, to the Old Testament, to our understanding of our faith, the, the calling of the coming Messiah in Jesus. These are the closing chapters, and in these closing chapters, uh, Isaiah is outlining the final destiny, the final destiny of those who will turn away from God and the final destinies of the, the final destiny of those who will turn their face towards God. And he's outlining for them, you know, what their final destiny would look like. As the chapter unfolds and as you keep reading down further and further, about verse 17 is where Isaiah starts to actually outline what this final destiny look like, looks like. And I'm just going to read a couple of passages, you know, from, the, from those excerpts, um, from that passage. Verse 17, Isaiah goes on to say, See, I create new heavens and new earth. The former things will not be remembered, nor will they come to mind. The sound of weeping, in verse 19, the sound of weeping and crying will be heard no more. Verse 20, never again will there be an infant who lives but a few days or an old man who does not live out his years. And it just kind of keeps going on. It's a beautiful passage from 17 right to the end about what the final destiny of those who turn their heart to God looks like. But interestingly enough, verses 1 to 5 is a real outline 
of why this future is possible for those who, you know, surrender their hearts and commit themselves to God. And it's very clear and obvious that what Isaiah is saying here is that this future is possible because of what God has done. Because what of God's work and his, his sacrifice and his work towards the people and towards humanity. You know, have you ever taken the time to appreciate the amazing amount of work that goes into simple everyday things in our lives, the simple everyday amenities that we enjoy. Have you ever thought about what it takes to turn on a faucet and, you know, be able to have water just come out? Have you ever thought about the amazing amount of work that has to go in for that? We can just go to a light switch, turn it on, and there it is. Have you ever thought about the amazing, the amazing work that goes into going towards cabinetry and just getting a plate out? Like people have to hold those things up with their arms. <laughs> I'm pouring looking at Tony right now. Have <laughs> you ever thought about some of the simple, like the amenities that we enjoy every day and the amazing amount of work that goes into just these simple things that we take in, t- uh, that, we, uh, that we enjoy? We begin to ab- appreciate the trades and we, we appreciate those who can do that kind of stuff for people because we know how much work and how tirelessly they labored so that we can benefit in some way on an everyday basis. And verse 1 is very much that out- outlines that very thing. Very w- verse 1 very much outlines what God has done for us. I love verse 1. It's just so, uh, it outlines just so perfectly. I revealed myself to those who did not ask for me. I was found by those who did not seek me. To a nation that did not call on my name, I said, here am I, here am I. I want you to think, what, what kind of work or how much work does it take? How much, work does, how much work is required to reveal yourself to someone who did not ask for you? You know, parents, maybe you recognize this. You know, you constantly, with your kids, you're telling them, I'm willing to help you, I'm willing to help you. Here, like, I'm, I'm here to help, and yet they don't listen. Teachers, wow, you must be just terribly frustrated on an everyday basis, the knowledge that you're pouring into your students, and yet there are a number of students you could probably think right off the top of your head that just, they're just not willing to receive it. You guys might have, if you've ever mentored someone, if you ever tried to walk alongside someone for a period of time and mentor them through an issue, and... You know, there's just no receiving of what, you know, what you're trying to do in their lives. And yet, God says that he revealed himself to people who did not ask. He works, uh, he looked out for people that were not looking for him. And he called out to people who did not call to him. Think of the work that is required to do that. Think of the compassion that is in God's heart to do that. It's one thing to say, yeah, if if someone's willing to seek out God, God is available. But God says, I've gone even further than that. I've revealed myself to those who did not seek me out. You know, God's salvation is not like a lighthouse during a storm. It's not a small light on the horizon that we're trying to work hard to get towards God's salvation is like the Coast Guard. It's like the Coast Guard who comes and finds you at the very spot you're at and guides you back home. You know, verses 2 to 5 really reveal to us and they help us understand where God's people, what was going on in the heart of God's people at that time. You know, he calls them an obstinate people. You know, they were stubbornly refusing to change their opinions to change their course of action despite attempts to be persuaded to do so. God says, or Isaiah says that they pursued their own imagination. They, weren't, they were meditating day and night on their own wishes and their own desires. You know, they ate the flesh of pigs and they cooked impure meats, which for the Jewish people we know was against their rules and their laws. But it's an indictment that says that the people were consciously willing to disobey God's commands and desires for them. You can see the heart of the people in this moment is very much turned away. And yet God says that is not going to be the final straw that breaks our relationship with them. God is still going to pursue them 
God's still going to do everything he can to restore the relationship he has with them. You know, the problem of Israel is definitely very parallel to the problem that we humans have as well. Our heart and our imagination tends to fill and be attracted to what we desire, what we want. We don't look and we don't naturally gravitate to the higher truths of God. We don't look to him naturally. And in some way, the, uh, the problem that we have is very much parallel to the problem that Israel had as you know, it's working through this time where it's being prepared to go into exile. And it's being prepared to have its heart changed. But God says he's still with us and he's still going to continue to work on them. You know, in many ways, uh, that's how we ought to explain the gospel. When we explain the gospel, we often talk about what we need to do as humans, and we often try and explain the gospel in a way that explains the benefits we all get, the benefit of eternal salvation, the benefit of, you know, not being separated from God. But maybe we need to explain the gospel in terms of what God has done for us, how far he has gone to actually restore this relationship, that he didn't just sort of put a flare up in the air and he just sees who's coming by to it, who, whoever sees it and just turns their heart and walks towards him. But rather, God has come alongside of us to move us and walk us back home, to bring us back to a right relationship with him. He didn't just put out a small, weak signal in hopes that someone would find it and they would turn, but rather God is kind of like an apprentice who comes alongside, who puts his arms around us. And this morning, you know, if you got feel that God is distant, remember the verse 1. Remember that God reveals himself to people who don't seek him out, that he is constantly working towards revealing himself to all of us, that we might all know him and have that right relationship with him. You know, maybe as you grew up, especially during youth group, or if you ever went to a large um, evangelistic initiative, there was, a, there was this pretty popular way of explaining the gospel. It was called gospel on, nap on a napkin. And the way that the gospel is kind of explained is, you know, God is over here and humanity is over here and there's a separation between God and humanity because of sin. And the cross and the work of the cross and death and Jesus' death and resurrection is a cross that bridges that gap. And now because of the cross, because of Jesus' death and resurrection, we have a chance to walk across that bridge and be with God. And that's pretty close to what, that is, that is true, but I think what God is saying here in the text and what he's explaining is that Jesus' death and resurrection isn't just an opportunity for us to walk across and go find God, but Jesus' death and resurrection was about God himself walking across that divide and coming to find us. He came and sought us out. He came and put his arms around us and to walk us back into that right relationship with him. You know, we have to think, what does verse 1 say about the character of God? I know that many uh, constantly lobby criticism that God is somehow malevolent and narrow-minded and full of hatred. What does verse 1 say about that? Verse 1 paints a picture of a God who pursues us and wants to be a part of our lives. You know, what does uh, verse 1 say about God's commitment to humanity? You know, and all the accusations that God has abandoned us and left us behind, that's not what I see in verse 1. Verse 1 talks about a God who does everything he can, including allowing his son to be sacrificed so that he might have a relationship with us. And what does it say about our value and our worth to him? that we should be a people that receive the benefit of that work, about, of that sacrifice that he made on our behalf. What does that say about our value to God? What does that say about our worth? And this morning, you know, if, if self-worth and self-value is something you struggle with, think about verse 1. Think about how much God loves you. Think about how, what he has done for you. That fills the heart with realizing that our value comes from him. And our value comes from what he determines and what he says about who we are. You know, this verse is echoed, uh, this sentiment is echoed in the words of Jesus when he gave the parable of the hidden treasure. 
when he said the kingdom in Matthew 13, he says the kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hidden in a field. When a man found it, he hid it again and then in his joy went and sold all he had and bought that field. You know, the, in the parable, the man is not looking for this treasure. His mind is on other things. He's aimlessly wandering around and he finds this treasure. He doesn't give the background to how that treasure got there, whether or not, you know, God put that treasure in that field. But the point is still the same, that we come across the kingdom of heaven in spectacular ways because God is constantly pursuing us. We come across the kingdom of heaven in un, uh, unimaginable ways, and we come across the kingdom of heaven in unforeseen ways, in unexpected ways, because God is constantly trying to f- pursue us and reveal himself to us, that we might know him and turn our hearts and follow him and dedicate our lives to him. And this morning, you know, if God seems distant, remember verse 1. If you struggle with your value and your worth, look to verse 1. Know that God has done a phenomenal amount of work to pursue you and to come alongside you to guide you back into that right relationship with God. Remember, as the gospel is preached, remember it's not about what we do and it's not about what we have to do or what we, uh, what we receive because of what Jesus' work at death and resurrection, but rather it's about what God did for us. And it's about uh, just being having a deeper sense of appreciation for what he has done to us. Now, I know that there are some Christians within the large Christian family that would say God's role in salvation was to actually go out and handpick who uh, he's going to save. And I have full respect for all my brothers and sisters, but that is just not something I can subscribe to. You know, God has revealed himself, and we all have a, a choice to make. We don't have work to do, but we have a choice to make. And he comes alongside of us and he's done everything to reveal himself. And I understand where that train of thought comes from. It is very true that God had to do an immense amount of work. You could say possibly 100% or 99.9% of the work, but he's done a lot of that work. And we need to have that appreciation in our heart, especially during a time when there are so many distractions in this world pulling for our attention. Let's remember what God has done for us as we walk into the next many months, as we come towards a a time of thanksgiving with our families. Let's remember all that God has done for us to reveal himself to us, his people, people who were not seeking his face, people who were uh, he called out to that even though we didn't call to him first and a people that uh, didn't seek to see him, but a people he still chose to reveal himself to. Let's pray. Father God, we are just so uh, filled with thanks and gratitude, and we just pray this morning that uh, our hearts would be transformed by that deep sense of your devotion to us. We pray, Father, that, you know, we would be more devoted to you. I pray, Father, that we would uh, be uh, more willing to lay down who we are for the sake of your, your will and your kingdom. I pray, Father, that all of us would walk away uh, from today just thinking about our everyday priorities, thinking about our everyday rhythms and habits, and rethinking them in the sense of what you want, and that we're doing that out of appreciation for what you've done for us. Father, you are good. You are great. You are loving. Your commitment knows uh, no bounds to us. Your commitment is an ocean with no bottom. Your commitment is a well with no end. It is a universe with no boundaries. Your commitment is unfathomable. And we can only but say thank you for what we've done and offer to you the willing sac- the, the, the good sacrifice of our everyday lives to your will and to your kingdom. In Jesus' name, amen. just stay seated unless you need to stand up and move around. I love you, Lord. 
Oh, your mercy never fails me All my days I've been held in your hands From the moment that I wake up Until I lay my head I will sing of the goodness of God It's so nice to not have to give uh, COVID instructions for leaving. Um, I just want to encourage everyone that there's no need to run off or um, just uh, take off, spend some time getting to see some people maybe you haven't seen in a little bit. Uh, you know, if you want prayer, because we've talked about something that is really meaningful and really speaks to your heart, please find myself. I'll be standing up here at the front, I'm happy just to pray for you at this time. It's something we haven't done in many, many months. So just will be available to you. I want to leave you with Jesus' words uh, to the man that he healed from demon possession and the instruction that he gives him, and I want to give these instructions to you. As Jesus was getting into the boat, the man who had been demon-possessed begged to go with him. Jesus said, Jesus did not let him, but said, go. Go to your home, to your own people, and tell them how much the Lord has done for you and how he has had mercy on you. So the man went away and began to tell uh, all the people in Decapolis how much Jesus had done for him and all the people were amazed and that is what I want to leave you with today go to your own people and tell them how much the Lord has done for you amen, amen.